everybody. Recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 121 of the Movement Debrief. And today, folks, you're about to hit the heart button on Hinge because we're going to talk about all things related to hinging. Yes, folks, I got a gang of questions that have been asked about hinging, and they've been asked by the people. They will be answered for the people by this people right here, fam recognized fam. Without further ado, let's debrief, shall we? The first question comes from Jason. Here's what Jason has to say. Hey Zach, huge fan. I was wondering about how we can get more finessed in our exercise prescription of hinging activities to improve sacral nutation and thus extension and internal rotation measures. Would the changes we see at the hip and pelvis as a result of these exercises be reflected at the thorax? Cheers. Jason, awesome question. Let's dive into this. Hinging. What is a hinge? Well, I'm glad you asked. Hinging is going to involve posterior displacement of the pelvis, whereas, or more horizontal displacement of the pelvis, whereas with a squat, there is more vertical displacement of the pelvis. So that's a squat, a hinge is more horizontal displacement. And there's obviously relative degrees of each. With that in mind, what are the mechanics that are occurring at the pelvis when I horizontally displace my pelvis. What's going to happen if done without compensatory mechanics is sacral nutation. What nutation involves is the sacrum, this big bone, right, that, that meets the two pelvic bones together, is going to tip forward, just like my hand tips forward. When that happens, you can see the coccyx move backwards. From a pelvic floor perspective, what happens in this case is when I nutate the sacrum, the posterior pelvic floor is going to become more eccentric. It's going to be on stretch. The anterior pelvic floor is going to become more concentric. That has to happen because when I nutate the sacrum, the anominates have to rotate posteriorly and the infrapubic angle, the IPA, my favorite one to drink, opens up. That opening up of the infrapubic angle is associated with some degree of concentric contraction of the anterior pelvic floor because the muscles there also co-contract with the adductors. The adductors are what pull the infrapubic angle apart. The total sum of that motion because there's more range of motion available at the sacrum than there is at the SI joint, the lumbosacral complex, the pelvis is going to tilt relatively anteriorly. Not a crazy amount, but that's just the direction that we're traveling. Because there is eccentric contraction or eccentric orientation of the posterior pelvic floor, that's where I have more motion available. I can move into places where I have eccentric capabilities. If I have too much concentric, I won't be able to complete that action. Thus, the pelvis moves more horizontally and posteriorly. For example, if, if that didn't make much sense, if I contract my bicep, right, and I have maximal elbow flexion, and I have all of this eccentric space available. I can't flex any further, but what I can do is I can go into the range of motion of elbow extension that I have available. That's assuming that I have normal mechanics. Same process here. If I'm concentric on the pelvic floor, on the front side, I can't go there. So I can only go where there's motion available. That's the eccentric component of the posterior pelvic floor, hence the horizontal and posterior displacement. If we want to improve our ability to nutate the sacrum and drive the hips posteriorly, we have to look at what restrictions may be present at the pelvis. What would I see be limited? When this nutation movement happens, there's going to be more movement into adduction and internal rotation 
at the femurs. The reason why you have a deduction is because when the infrapubic angle gets wider, the pubic bones get closer to the femurs. Just like if I a deduct the femur, I'm bringing the femur closer to the pubic bones. Same motion happening there. Also, when you get nutation of the sacrum, and I have subsequent posterior rotation of the nominates, the acetabulum is going to orient more inward, which is going to bias the femurs into more internal rotation, assuming there are no compensatory mechanics. And I should state that all of this is assuming normal mechanics are available. If you're hinging, you need adduction and you need internal rotation. You'll notice that I left out flexion versus extension. And there's a reason for that. You can have a deduction and internal rotation with either flexion or extension. It depends on where you're at in the range of motion. For example, I can have extension, a deduction, and internal rotation paired together when I do something like sprinting. If I were to extend this femur to its physiological end range, and I keep going, going, going like the Energizer Bunny, I don't have any more motion available at the femoroacetabular joint, so I have to pick it up somewhere. What happens in that case is the, uh, the pelvis is going to tilt more forward, and the sacrum will have to nutate accordingly. That's how relative motions work. You take up slack in one direction, and then the opposing or the remaining joints have to move in accordance if you're going to keep going in that direction. I can also, though, have relative adduction and internal rotation in a flexed position. If we go back to my squat debrief, which I'll link in the show notes, which will be found on zackcouples.com forward slash hinge. If we go back to that and we look at the ranges of motion that occur throughout the squat, when I go from about either 45 to 60 degrees of hip flexion to about 90 to 100, the posterior rotators of the hip switch from more of an external rotation bias to an internal rotation bias. Thus, from 60 to 100 degrees, or 45 to 100 degrees, give or take, of hip flexion, I'm going to have more of an adduction and internal rotation bias. And subsequently, the sacrum is going to be more, is going to be nutating. So I have nutating happening at those ranges, and I also have nutating, or the sacrum nutating, at hip extension. If I have restrictions in either of those positions then, I lack full hip extension, or I can't get to the 90, 110 degrees of, of hip flexion in a squat. Those could be two prime situations when you would want to drive hinge-based activities. And usually, the order that I would go after those in those two scenarios would be restoring the squat range of motion first, getting the ability to achieve 90 to 100 degrees of hip flexion, and then I would go after the extension. Let me recap things real quick. Adduction, internal rotation, associated with nutation of the sacrum, which is what needs to happen when I perform a hinge. That can happen in hip extension or at 45 to 60 degrees of hip flexion at the start, ending at about 90 to 100 degrees of hip flexion. I would pursue hip flexion, adduction, and internal rotation first. And here's why. If we look at compensatory mechanics, so everything we talked about was normal mechanics. Now let's go into compensation nation. In compensatory mechanics, the pelvis, for most people, is going to have an anterior orientation. That's not necessarily nutation of the sacrum because it can happen a wide variety of ways. For example, if I have this huge concentric contraction of the erector spinae muscles, I can lift the pelvis as a unit into anterior orientation without having much effect on the pelvic floor dynamics. That would be one example. If the pelvis is oriented anteriorly for some reason, 
What may happen in compensatory mechanics is the hip flexors could get leverage to develop a concentric orientation, meaning that there's a bias at the hip joint into hip flexion and subsequently hip extension would be lost. When I go down into a squat and I can go all the way down, ass to grass, that's going to drive maximal sacral counternutation and subsequently posterior pelvic tilt because that motion is needed for the bottom of a squat. If I can't get that, or if I can achieve the bottom of a squat all the way down, that means I have the ability to remove my pelvis as far as possible from the compensatory situation that I had to start, which is an anterior orientation. If I were to go after hip extension right from the get-go, which remember folks, hip extension is going to bias a little bit more nutation of the sacrum or anterior pelvic tilt slash orientation. If I do that and I can't achieve the stacked position, the thoracic diaphragm being atop the pelvic diaphragm, I could run the risk of getting into the compensatory mechanics and thus you wouldn't restore the range of motion that you need to to complete hip extension. The truism or the rule remains, folks, if you can't stack, don't talk to Zach. It's much easier to stack if you focus on the squat because the squat is going to get you out of the anterior pelvic orientation. Therefore, I will not drive, from a programming aspect, I typically will not coach hinging activities until I can get someone close to parallel in a squat, that 90 to 100 degrees of hip flexion. Because then to get that last little bit to get them to parallel or even start going below, I can start programming hinging based activities. Generally, you know, from, from my clinical experience, if someone can squat to parallel or slightly below, they have a better ability of achieving the stack and maintaining that when I coach them into the hinge because it's really hard to maintain that stack position and then orient your pelvis horizontally. Because what, what are the common compensations we see people do when they hinge, folks? Either they're gonna do the J-Lo thing, stick the butt out, and then hinge that way, which is a loss of the stack, or when they go to do a hinge because they've been practicing the, the posterior tilting action till they're blue in the face as they round forward. If you can get a parallel squat, I've found that that allows for a true posterior displacement of the pelvis while maintaining a stack. Let's look at this practically. Let's say you have someone who is just close to getting parallel and you're ready to introduce some hinging. First place I go more often than not is a kettlebell deadlift. I think that that's a great position to teach the hinge and you can really control for someone's ability or inability to stack by elevating the kettlebell. So that's usually my first place that I will start someone coaching the hinge. Some of my favorite cues are, I need to find some way, shape or form to push the pelvis posteriorly. And you'll notice that I'm using my finger and pushing right at the inguinal crease. A lot of times that's my first cue is I'll push at the inguinal crease and say you got to push this part back or I'm going to karate chop you in half. That works really well. But let's say you don't have the ability to utilize a tactile cue like that, which I think is amazing. You can use other verbal cues to elicit the same thing. My favorites are either push your hips backward, fold in half at the waist, or you can imagine this one, I like this one. There's a table right in front of you. You want to smack your face to the table. Those are three great cues that I really like. Another cue that I like actually is coaching someone to raise their arms out in front as they go into the hinge position. Why is that useful? The reason why I would argue that that's useful is because when I reach at 90 degrees of shoulder flexion, and I dive more into this in the debrief that I'll link, but when I dive into 90 degrees of shoulder flexion, that's actually going to create posterior concentric contraction of my upper back and subsequently eccentric contraction of my anterior chest, which 
is the same dynamics that I need when I perform a hinge. Because a hinge, I know we only talked about the pelvis, but if we work our way upstairs, we should see relative flattening and straightening of the spine. Reaching forward helps assist with that straightening. If you want to talk in terms of respiratory mechanic terms, a hinge is going to have more of an exhaled bias, which is nutation at the sacrum, a slight increase in lumbar lordosis or a return to lumbar lordosis, and a flattening of the upper back. If you reach straight forward, that promotes that flattening of the upper back. And it's why it can be a really useful cue to use when coaching someone to hinge. So I'll start with kettlebell deadlifts and then eventually work to trap bar. Most people, I end at trap bar because, you know, from a conventional deadlift standpoint, the, the ROI beyond that is not really useful for my population. Now, granted, my population is mostly either people in pain or people who are wanting to improve their movement options. Uh, dinged up power lifters or, or you know, people who have lifted heavy. I could totally conceive of programming a conventional deadlift for two people. One, if it's part of your sport, so you're a power lifter or you're into bodybuilding, probably a good move to use. I could also see that for someone who does need some increase in force production and needs to really bias the end range of a hinge position or nutation. Because when you do have to do a conventional deadlift, you have to be able to drive a large amount of nutation at the sacrum. So it could be really useful for that population as well. Thinking sprinters or basically anyone who needs that horizontal power and strength, it would be a great move. I could also conceive of utilizing a um, sumo deadlift, although it's not, not something I've played with as much, but a sumo deadlift for someone who has difficulty breaking parallel in a squat just because when you go into the wider base of support and you limit your depth to that mid-range, you'll actually be driving more internal rotation at the femurs. That could be another useful tool to driving the positioning that we need. Also, because of that wide base of position of, of abduction at the femurs, that could be useful for creating a relative narrowing of the infrapubic angle, which two situations. If I have someone who's wide and I abduct the femurs and I'm driving a little bit of internal rotation, well, or at least the abduction component, that might actually create some degree of narrowing of the IPA. You could also argue that someone who's already narrow, if I take them and I narrow the pelvis even further, you could have essentially a stretch shortening contraction to leading to opening of the outlet, especially because in that scenario, because you're limiting the depth via a sumo deadlift, you're going to be driving more internal rotation at the femurs, which is going to allow the pelvic outlet to open up. Those would be some of the situations that I could see utilizing a conventional or sumo deadlift. But for most people, I will typically program up to a trap bar as my terminal, and that's usually about as far as I take it. Another question, that Jason asked in this is how, how could we use this to improve extension? Because in the double limb hinging case, that seems to help you with flexion, adduction IR, positioning, which would be mid-range of your squat. What about driving hip extension? In my eyes, I like utilizing more of the single leg variations to complete that action. So that could be doing a split RDL, which I'll link in the show notes. So with a single leg RDL, that can be really useful because, well, one, you're getting to about 90 degrees of hip flexion, so you're driving nutation there, but two, because you're keeping the back leg straight, that's another position to drive further sacral nutation. That could be a great terminal exercise to drive hip extension, which I really like. Um, split RDLs are a great regression from that. I also like, in the middle of that would be like a tap RDL, which is basically the bridge between a split RDL and a single leg RDL, where you're still reaching back as you would with a single leg RDL, but you're just tapping the ground. So that way you still have a little bit of ground contact. Those would be some of my big moves for getting the extension component of hinging. In terms of the last bit of Jason's question is, what would we see at the thorax? And I touched on this briefly with the forward reach. 
but if you're performing a hinge-based exercise, you would see a concentric posterior thorax and subsequently an eccentric anterior thorax. Because when you perform the hinge action and the spine stays relatively flat, that's associated with an exhale-based posture and can be a great way to improve pump handle mechanics. To summarize your great question, Jason. Hinging leads to nutation at the sacrum, which is that sacrum tipping forward. The pelvis is going to tilt relatively anteriorly, and that's great for adduction and internal rotation-based movements that you need. That can occur at hip flexion, usually 90 to 100 degrees of hip flexion maximally, or at hip extension, zero and beyond. If you have restrictions in those areas, that could be a prime time to utilize hinging. Start with a kettlebell deadlift, work your way to trap bar. If you really need increased force production and concentric activity, then you could go with a conventional or sumo. If you need hip extension, that's where I like the single leg version, split RDL and a single leg RDL. And if you do those things, your hinge game ought to be on fleek and you ought to be in business. Amazing question, Jason. Train Elite SC. If you have a wide ISA and limited hinge pattern, what's your favorite strategies for restoring adduction and internal rotation to increase the hinge? If you have a wide ISA with a limited hinge, so in theory, right, a wide infrasternal angle is going to have more of an exhaled bias at the spine, meaning they actually should be really good at hinging. They should be able to nutate the sacrum, shoot the hips back. If you don't have that, then what has likely happened is something has stolen the ability to create that hinge posture. If you see someone who can't hinge and they're wide, chances are they've probably had something concentric happen in the front. Because think about this. If I have gone concentric on my backside, I'm utilizing an exhaled posture, the spine is flat, I should, if I take a breath of air in, have the ability to push air into the front side of the body. And that should allow me to complete the hinge movement. If you have a concentric strategy on the front side of the body, perhaps the pump handles down, that's a common one. I'll link a debrief in the show notes to troubleshoot that you need to probably improve that mobility first. If someone's got internal rotation limitations that, or extension or adduction at the shoulder, you need to go after that first. I would do that. The next piece I would say is, you, of course, and this probably supersedes that, but make sure you're achieving the stack position. And more often than not, for, for wide ISA folks, I try to drive squat mechanics for as long as I possibly can. I found that if you can bias someone to get a really good squat who's wide, as we talked about before, that takes them away from their compensatory strategy, which is throwing the pelvis into anterior tilt. So if you get them as far removed from that as possible, it's usually easier to restore a hinge. And that's how I would go if we're talking about a wide infrasternal angle presentation who stinks at hinging. It's usually because of a secondary compensation. Awesome question. The next question comes from my man, the myth, the legend himself, Jordan. Here's what Jordan asks. How would you actually go about recapturing hip extension yourself? We talked about this with the last question, but let's say that you have a client who you want to drive hip extension but they're not ready for a split RDL or a single leg RDL. Maybe they're still trying to figure out the, the hinge, the bilateral stance hinge. And you need to go with some drills that are a little bit easier than any type of RDL or deadlift variation. What I would recommend doing in that case is something that is more supported that is driving hip extension. There's three moves that I really like and I'll link all of them in the show notes. The first one would be a wall stride which with a wall stride, essentially what you're doing is you're driving one knee to the chest and curling the hips up on your back with your foot on the wall. That's a really good move to drive hip extension. My next one would be a side-lying stride, which is same thing. I'm in the side-lying position, using the wall to push hip extension, and I'm driving the bottom knee up 
My last one that I like is a rock back hip extension where you're in quadruped on elbows. You got one knee up to your chest, pushing the other one into the wall. Those are three great moves to drive hip extension. Really, and those are my favorites, but you can drum up whatever you want. It's just if you have someone who can't get hip extension with standing-based activities, you have to regress it. So you could do a lot of different things. Think about anything that is more supported um, than something like a, a deadlift or a hinge. And, and you don't even have to go to ground-based activities. You could do a double limb supported split squat to drive hip extension. You could do anything. I would find moves that require more support that are not in standing that push the pelvis into hip extension. And that can be anything that, one, creates a stack, gets a little bit of posterior tilt of the pelvis, and then two, drives a little bit of femoral extension to get you in the position. One of my, uh, my heuristics that I encourage people to follow at my seminar, Human Matrix, is to put people into positions that they cannot achieve. So if you can't get hip extension, you need to put yourself into hip extension. But I would do so with a stack position because if you do that, then you're not going to fall into compensatory mechanics and you're going to get your hip extension range of motion back. Great question, Jordan. I will link those moves in the show notes, so please check them out. We got a question on IG. Bates Michael said, gosh, it sounds like you could be in Hollywood. You should be. What would be your go-to to improve a hinge in a narrow with a lot of compression in the posterior thorax dorsal rostral area? Believe it or not, if you have someone who's a narrow and they have a lot of posterior compression, meaning they have a, a more concentric posterior thorax, among other things, they'll actually be better at hinging because their spine is resembling more of an exhaled strategy, which is what you need to complete the hinge movement. So if they have compensatory mechanisms, what you actually have to do is shoot them the other direction as much as you can. You have to get them to be a normal narrow infrasternal angle because generally a narrow infrasternal angle based on the inhaled spine orientation, they should be better at squatting. So if they have a loss of a squat, you actually want to restore that first and foremost as much as possible, then take them into the hinge position. Because what the, the squat's gonna do, as you talked about with those limitations and expansion, is it's gonna create the posterior expansion that they need. Once they have that, then they likely have enough real estate to perform hinging actions without falling into compensatory activities. Force Velocity 36. Hey Zach, what's going on? Well, you know, I'm just chilling, doing a debrief and all. Why would the Camperini deadlift be useful for? Um, so, uh, you know, I actually haven't, exp like, uh, that's a good question. I haven't played much with the Campo deadlift. My thought would be, if I'm thinking it's the right move, so correct me if I'm wrong, but that's where you have uh, one foot. I'll, I'll find a link for the show notes, but you have one foot where it's, on like a step or something and it would be in front of the body and then the back leg would be straight so you're you know it's kind of like the Captain Morgan pose and if I'm doing this wrong please let me know and then you would do a hinge action in that position that's if, if that's correct and if it's not please let me know from what I'm seeing in the mechanic side of things that should help with the uh, achieving the amount of nutation needed for 90 to 100 degrees of hip flexion. And the reason why that is, is because in that type of deadlift, when I have an offset where the right leg is more flexed and the left leg is more extended, when I create this offset position, that's actually gonna create a little bit of sacral rotation to the left, which at the pelvis is going to be some degree of counter nutation on the left side, and it's gonna be some nutation on the right side. If I hinge in that position and I limit myself to 90 to 100 degrees of, of hip flexion, which you know, in a hinge like that you're going to have, what's gonna happen is the sacrum is going to have to begin nutating forward from a counter-nutated starting point, which guess what, folks? When I go 
to 90 to 100 degrees of hip flexion in a squat, that's what's going on. If I go through the squat, I get counter nutation of the sacrum at the start. And then from zero to 45 to 60 degrees, I drive more counter nutation. So at this point in time, the pelvis is in a counter nutated orientation. When I go from 60 to like 90, 100 degrees of hip flexion, the sacrum starts nutating. But that doesn't mean that it orients forward. So I'm nutating, I'm moving towards nutation from a counter nutated position. In the Campo deadlift, you would have the same thing. It biases a, new, a counter nutated starting point on the left and then drives the nutation movement from that position. So if you have a restriction at the mid range of a squat, I could see it being useful. It's just not a move that I've experimented what much with. Um, and that's likely due to my population and me using other moves. But it is something that I've been using on myself a little bit just to see. Um, stay tuned, I need to get better at coaching it. But awesome question. The next question comes from Chris. Here's what Chris asks. You have a blog post on deadlifts where you recommend a snatch grip RDL as a regression. Could you explain why a snatch grip RDL forces more thoracic flexion? Why, yes, I can. It all has to deal with the position that you can drive the scaps in. If I want to get posterior thorax expansion or thoracic flexion, I need to do things that create scapular internal rotation, namely the medial borders of the scapula have to move away from the rib cage. That's going to eccentrically orient the scapular external rotators, which will reduce the amount of expansion posteriorly if they're concentric. If I need to create expansion or stretching into the upper back, I have to have more scapular internal rotation. With a snatch grip RDL, I have two things that are working in my favor to drive that scapular internal rotation position. The first is that my arms are at zero degrees roughly of shoulder flexion. The resting position of the scapula, according to a study done by Ludwig et al. And yes, folks, it will be in the show notes. But that study showed that the normal resting position of the scapula is about 41 degrees of internal rotation. That's at rest. Now, granted, there's going to be some wiggle room and individual differences, but what I took that as is if you start at zero, you're going to have a little bit of IR at the scaps. Then if I go with a wide grip, that's going to drive more internal rotation at the humerus. But wait, Zach, internal rotation at the humerus, that's associated with expansion in the front. How's that going to get me expansion in the upper back? Well, I'm glad you asked. The reason why it's going to get me expansion in the upper back is because when I'm in that position, if I drive an excessive amount of internal rotation, which I do, once you take up the slack into humeral IR and you've run out of room, you have the phenomenon of relative motion occurring. If I IR the humerus and I keep going, going, and going, the scapula has to follow suit. So the scapula begins to orient with the humerus, which is an internal rotation. So if I have that wide grip and I IR the humeri without crunching, boom, you're going to get upper back expansion. And it can be really useful as a regression for driving the hinge. Because what can happen is if I have too much concentric activity on the posterior side of the body, that could reduce my ability to achieve a stacked position. Hence, a snatch grip RDL is a great way to encourage the stack position while you go into a hinge. Awesome question. The last question comes from Will. Here's what Will asks. For the hinge pattern, you noted that it's an exhalation strategy, thus biasing a pronatory twist of the foot. A lot of teaching is to activate the foot. Three points of contact. Hashtag tripod foot. What you going to do about it? He didn't say that. It's just something I added. Which, but when I emphasize this tripod foot, it results in a more supinated, tented foot position. Is this going to lead to a compensatory and lower power position? What are your cueing and teaching for ground rooting mechanics for hinging athletes? 
Good question. So will with, with this action, I'm not necessarily looking at the foot being incredibly flat when I'm doing a hinge. When I say that a foot is going to be more pronated in a deadlift or hinging pattern, I'm talking more about in comparison to a squat, what the relative bias is. If I compare those two moves, a squat and a hinge, because a squat is more inhaled bias, there's going to be more of a supination action in those movements than there would be in a deadlift. That doesn't mean that in a squat, I'm supinated to the nth degree. Just like in a deadlift, that doesn't mean that I'm pronated to the nth degree. But comparing those two actions, that's the foot positioning. And it's one reason why in a squat, generally those go better and look better when you have a heel elevation because heel elevation is going to plantar flex and invert the foot, which is associated with inhalation mechanics. And it's another reason why with a deadlift, you generally go with flat feet or barefoot or with flatter shoes. Because if I have a flatter foot, that's going to drive more dorsiflexion and eversion of the foot, which is associated with exhalation mechanics, which is associated with mastering your deadlift. You don't want extremes in either position. From coaching standpoint, I don't always focus on the foot. In fact, that's way down the line because more often than not, when you're coaching someone to do any type of hinge or any movement at all, you want to focus on the cues that are going to get you the most bang for your buck. And in my biased opinion, teaching the stack position is going to get you the most bang for your buck it clears up most of the movement restrictions or issues that you see. And if you lose that, you're going to lose the movement. If you can't stack, don't talk to Zach. But let's say you can. Let's say you got the stack and you want to make sure that your squat or your hinge is on fleek. What I would do in that case, Will, is I would agree with you. I would coach a tripod foot position, but I would bias the position of the foot with my shoe wear. For example, if I'm deadlifting, I know for a fact that having a bare foot or having a flatter sole foot is going to create more of a dorsiflexed and everted position than if I had an Olympic lifting shoe. Don't believe me? Try deadlifting with an Olympic lifting shoe or high heels. It doesn't go well, especially high heels. So just use that foot position to bias it without having to do any coaching and then feel those three points of contact on your foot, namely the heel, the, uh, the, the big toe, the MTP, and then the outside of the, the fifth metatarsal. Those would be your three points of contact. You would do the exact same thing when we're talking about a squat. I'm gonna bias the squat so the foot's more plantar flex and inverted, that way I don't have to coach it and then I would find and feel those three points of contact. And if you do those things, your squat or your deadlift or whatever move you want to do is going to be on fleek. You're going to be more powerful than you can possibly imagine, and you're going to be in business. Great question, Will, and I think that's a good stopping point for us today. I want to thank all of you beautiful, sexy, outstanding people for tuning in to number 121, I hope that this COVID thing, it sounds like we're going on the upswing a little bit, and whether we like it or not, that's kind of nice. So I hope that you are staying safe, healthy, and, and prosperous during this time. If you want to learn more because you're still stuck in your home because of the COVID, you want to check out ZachCouples.com. While you're there, subscribe to my newsletter because I got a gang of stuff for you. You know what I got for you? I got access to my free course, the Human Matrix Foundations course. And the reason why you want to do it through the newsletter is because you'll also get the Common Compensations Workbook. Human Matrix Foundations is going to give you all the basics you need to be successful at understanding the stuff that I'm talking about. And then Common Compensations is going to simplify your coaching by showing you the two common compensatory strategies or movements that you'll see with common movements in the gym. Whether it's a deadlift, whether it's a squat, whether it's a push-pull, you'll have your full or your fill.
I'll also have five hours of talks on there for you, a free acute to chronic workload calculator so you don't hurt yourself when you're progressing load, all types of good stuff. And every Friday, you're going to get goodies from your boy, all the good stuff that's on the internet, the best hip hop out there. I got the hookup for you. Holler if you hear me. I also offer some services on my website. First, I got to say it, folks, Human Matrix, my seminar is available for you. I am currently doing them in person once the apocalypse is over. If you want to get coached one-on-one, hands-on, with your boy, I would definitely check out Human Matrix. I got a bunch lined up next year. The first one, assuming we have things somewhat back to normal, which who knows, um, August 1st and 2nd, Boston, Massachusetts, September 12th to 13th in Montreal, Canada, October 3rd and 4th in Ann Arbor, Michigan, November 7th and 8th in Charlotte, North Carolina, November 21st and 22nd in San Diego, California, May 1st and 2nd, 2021, Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm working on rescheduling some of the ones I had to cancel, so stay tuned. Other services. If you are struggling with your hinge, you can't get it to feel right because you have some restrictions in motion and you need those restrictions addressed, guess who can help you with that? Your yeah, boy. I offer movement consultations. What we'll do is I will run you through a full body assessment, find out where your restrictions are, give you activities to improve those restrictions, get your hinge back on fleek. If you want to take that up a notch and you want to improve your fitness on top of that, you want to know where hinging fits in your programming, but you're unsure where, that's where my online training comes into play because we'll take the exact same movement consultation that I did with you and apply it in a fitness context so you can get your fitness gains on fleek and still move well. If you want to learn how to do this stuff with your people and you're like, well, Zach, this is good that you talked about hinging. I just don't know how it fits for my specific clientele. And I want someone to hold me accountable, to give me feedback on my coaching and cueing. That's where the mentorship program comes into play. Definitely sign up for that. Once you've scoured ZachCouples.com, you'll want to hook, hook, search for me on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher because guess what, folks? There's 120 other debriefs out there, and uh, you know you might not want to look at me for all of them. I get it. I get it. So check me out on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. Search The Zach Couple Show. While you're there, leave a review so the fam can keep growing. Social media-wise, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Those are both at Z Couples. Of course, I'm on the Instagram, baby. Zach, Z-A-C, Couples, C-U-P-P-L-E-S. And last but not least, you can find me on YouTube. Search Zach Couples if you want a gang of exercises to improve your movement restrictions. That is the place to go. Thank you so much for tuning in. You've been an amazing audience. Keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving, and I'll see you next time. Deuces.